going through this lecture, and one of my goals with this lecture is to present to you a new perspective, that pain is not actually a curse, but yet it is a blessing from God, which He has given to you. Um, now, if you want to know a little bit about, um, more about me, um, I have a YouTube channel where I share some devotionals and podcasts. So if you're interested in any of those, you, can, um, you should have these in your binders as well, so you can go in that link. So we're going to start a lecture for today, The Gift That Nobody Wants, which is pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I'm not sure the page, but um, it's, it's somewhere there. So um, how many of you like to receive gifts? I, I do as well. And, um, you know, um, my favorite time of the year is my birthday. Why is that? Because I got gifts, right? Now, how many of you ever thought of pain being a gift? Not many. Okay, one, of, one in, in all of us here. So, you know, it's interesting that we don't think on this as a gift, right? So we're going to be talking a little bit more about this in the lecture, how we can, um, you know, um, not only manage pain, but what can we do in, um, to help and how can we do to, uh, to analyze what we are feeling as well. So let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we are so thankful for um, your word and we are thankful for um, also natural remedies. As we go into it, we pray that you uh, teach us, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is pain? How, how would you describe pain? What is pain? Discomfort? Hurt? Ouch, that's right. What else? How, how would you say pain is? Irritation. All of those are correct. In, the, in that book that I just mentioned, The Gift of Pain, it's given this definition. It says there is a localized or generalized unpleasant bodily sensations that cause mild to severe physical discomfort. Now, at first it's going to cause discomfort, but after you start feeling you know, more and more pain, it becomes more and more severe. And emotional distress and typically results from bodily disorder, meaning, you know, you do something, let's say you um, sprain your ankle, so you're going to feel pain, right? Um, things like that. Now, we, when we think about pain, we think that pain is an enemy. And guess what we do with pain? We numb it. Or we, you know, we just stop thinking about it. And there is this quote that it says that pain is no invading enemy, is, is a loyal messenger dispatched by my own body to alert me to some danger. How is that? You know, when, when we think about pain, the first thing that comes to our mind is what can I do to numb this pain, right? We never stop to think, you know, what, why, why am I having this pain? You know, where is this coming from? Um, let's imagine this scenario. You s started baking a cake and um, let's say you have uh, a boy that called George. George is there playing and then after several hours the cake is in the oven. George decides to go there and like every child, you know, like to mess things around and touch on things and opens the oven and reaches for the cake. Guess, guess what will happen to his hand? Burn. He's going to burn. Now, the pain is going to be so, it's going to be so uncomfortable that it's going to prompt him to do what? He's going to pull his hand out. The same thing with us. But now, let's imagine another scenario. Let's say that um, George had um, leprosy. You know, leprosy is known because sometimes you lose the feelings in your extremities. And let's say that, you know, um, leprosy usually is between the ages of 5 to 15, com most common, and over the, the, the age of 30, and most predominant with males. Now, um, George reaches out for the cake, but this time George is not going to pull his hand out. Why is that? He doesn't feel pain. Now, was it a blessing or a curse that he felt the pain? Why was it a blessing? Because it prompts him to act. And the very unpleasant, unpleasantness of pain, the thing that we don't like, is the thing that most benefits us. Because it's going to prompt us to act, to take our hands out of the oven, right? Now, um, we, I, I mentioned this disease, leprosy, because in the book, Dr. Paul Brand, he actually um, worked with um, patients with leprosy. 
and working, you know, several years with them, he realized that this pattern was common, that, you know, um, in one side of the world, like, in, let's say here in the States, we, we are so used to numbing pain, and there he was seeing pain as a blessing. Why? Because all his pain, patients keep hurting themselves because they didn't have pain. They keep hurting themselves and the pain that was supposed to be actually preventing them from some greater danger. So what's the modern view of pain that we have in our days today? It, in the modern view, pain is an enemy that must be expelled. This approach has a crucial, dangerous flaw. Once regarded as an animal, not a warning signal, pain loses its power to instruct. Did you know that pain can instruct? Let's say if you have, you know, chest pain. You know, um, if you go to a doctor, he's going to say, well, um, it's probably something wrong with your heart or you're having acid reflux, different things, right? But now guess if you start in having that pain and you take something for it, it's going to numb the pain and you're not going to be able to find what is it actually causing the pain, right? I'm not saying that we should never take things because um, I believe there is a, a place and we're going to be talking a little bit more about that as the lecture goes on. But before we even think on getting something, we should think, you know, um, what, is, uh, what is this pain coming from? What is this, um, what is happening? Silencing pain without considering its message is like disconnecting a ringing fire alarm to avoid receiving bad news. Well, let's say there is a fire alarm and you just disconnect, so the fire starts. When you realize that, that um, the fire is going, your house is going to be burnt already. The same thing with pain. If we keep silencing pain, and we silence, and we silence, and we silence, guess what happened at the end? You know, um, just like the house is going to burn, we are not going to be able to preserve our health. We are actually going to be um, with less and less, um, we are going to be less and less healthier. Oh, the next one. The, the path to health for an individual or a society must begin by taking pain into account. Instead, we silence pain when we should be straining our ears to listen to it. We, we work too long and too hard, and we take something to calm us down. We look upon pain as the illness rather than the symptom. And because we look to pain as the illness, we never treat the real cause of, you know, of that pain. We keep silencing pain, silencing pain, and at the end, we realize that, you know, we haven't been treating the cause all along. When we ignore or silence our pain, before we actually get to know the, where the pain is coming from, um, it actually it says here that rather than trying to solve the pain by eliminating it, we must learn to listen to it and then manage it. So um, what we can get from this quote here as well, and um, all the pages of the book, um, after you can go over and see, there's the pages in the bottom, but um, all this, the, the pain that we have, first we gotta seek, you know, to listen to it. Where is it coming from? And then we gotta seek to manage it. Now, as I said, pe perhaps instead of solving the pain by eliminating, we should be listening to it, right? Now, there is the greatest, the greatest decision we need to make is whether we silence the pain and we destroy the body, or we listen to the pain and preserve the body. And then you, you're probably asking yourself, how are you going to preserve your body if you are listening to pain? I'm not saying that, you know, we should be taking pleasure in pain and not taking anything for pain. But pain is something that is a messenger that it wants to tell you something. But just like if someone comes to your house and say, listen, um, you know, the, the house here in the side is burning. But now you never answer the door. You're never going to know that the house was burning, correct? The same thing with pain. You answer your pain by um, sending, you know, looking, wh where is this coming from? What is happening here? And viewed in this way, when we view pain as something that is going to preserve our bodies, we're going to stop thinking that it's a curse. We're going to stop thinking that it's injustice. We're going to stop thinking that it's um, um, or something or a failure. And we start, we're going to start thinking that it's a gift and a blessing, something that we cannot live without. Have you ever stopped to think that, you know, we cannot live without pain. If we live without pain, the smallest thing we would not even see that we would be hurt. You know, there is people, um, I forgot the name of the condition, but there is people that they actually, they are born and they, I mean, they don't feel pain. And they keep hurting themselves more and more, you know. And we're going to be talking about a very interest, uh, interesting case um, here as the lecture goes on. So the question ar arises, how do we actually listen to pain? 
You know, how can we do that? How we listen to pain? Or what does this expression mean? And first, before we understand um, what it actually me means on um, listening to pain, we need to understand also the stages of pain. But we go on to say, how can we listen to pain? Well, by asking simple questions when you are feeling something. Just like question as, is there a pattern to this pain? To this pain? You know, it's, you know, every time after I eat that this pain is happening, or, you know, when I wake up after I exercise. Another one, does it occur at regular times? Is it, you know, a specific time every day that is occurring? It's just like when you get into your job and you are very stressful, is that pain occurring then? Does it seem to relate with my job? What seems to alleviate that pain? What makes it better? Am I worried, bitter, or angry? Am I anxious about the future? Those are questions that we need to ask ourselves because we're going to be seeing that the final stage of pain takes place in our minds and our minds have um, an effect in pain as well. Am I angry with God? You know, sometimes we, we are angry with God because we didn't get what we want, right? I, I don't know if it happened to you, but it happened to me many times. So we're going to be talking also about the volumes of pain. So it says the first pain is going to whisper. It whispers to us in the early stages at a subconscious level. We sense a slight discomfort and change position in bed or adjust a jogging style. Let's say you are walking and you have some new shoes on. And you know, until you get used to it, you might feel a little discomfort. Now, the pain, uh, first, as I said, pain is going to whisper. Then it speaks. It speaks louder as the danger increases. A hand grows tender after raking leaves or a foot grows sore in new shoes. And then at last, pain shouts. Pain shouts when the danger becomes severe. It forces a person to limp or even hop to hop or else quitting running out together. Let's say you are having a pain in your foot and it's going to become so severe that you, you just can't handle it anymore. And guess what's going to happen? You're just going to stop running or you're going to start having a limp and walking in, um, in a different way, right? So we talked about the, the volumes of pain and now the question comes is that if, if I let's say if I silence the pain at any level of it, what is going to happen? We are not going to receive the, comf the discomfort of it, which is the very thing that makes us to act. And um, being alert, like to our bodies, for us to be alert that something is happening is not enough. For, you know, why, why have you ever stopped to think why pain needs to be unpleasant? Because if it wasn't unpleasant, if it was just something that would have an alert, Guess what will happen? We would never listen to it. The very, it says here, we, um, being alert of the danger is not enough. We must be forced to respond. It is not enough to treat, um, it says here, the very, the very reason why pain, or one second, the very reason why pain must be unpleasant is because the pain will continue until you figure out something to do and where is it coming from. And the very unpleasantness of pain, the part that we hate, is the very fact that makes pain so effective at protecting us. Have you ever stopped to think that, you know, that very thing that, that annoys you, that is unpleasant, is the very thing that is protecting you. Because if you didn't have that, if it was just an alert, guess what would happen? You would just be ignoring. You would not be forced to act. So listening to pain is about to looks, is about looking to where is the cause of this pain? Where is this coming from? What, what are the things that I'm doing that changes pain, right? Now, there is a story, um, a good example of ignoring our body's um, pain warning system in the story of Bob Gross. In one NBA basket, um, basketball game, a star player Bob Gross was asked to start despite a badly injured ankle. You know, he was the star of the team and he needed to play but he had an injury. So guess what they did? It says here that the team doctor injected Markin, a strong painkiller, into Gro's foot in three different places. So he was injected in something to numb the pain. Now, and he went to play. He wasn't feeling anything and he went. During, during the game, Gro's was battling for a rebound and then guess what happened? Everyone heard a loud snap throughout all the stadium. And it says, was, was heard throughout the arena. Gross still run uh, up and down the court um, twice. Then he crumpled in the floor. Although he feel no pain, a bone had broken in his ankle. Now, by canceling out pain's warning system, 
Gross had laid himself open to an injury that caused permanent damage and prematurely ended his career. Just because he decided to silence the pain, to ignore it, and to just, in despite of anything, keep playing. You know, the same thing it may be with us. It may not be to, a, to that degree, right, that we need to, um, that we need to, or we are playing something. But you know, if we just keep silencing, silencing, and silencing pain, guess what will happen? We're, ne we're never going to be um, aware of the danger that, it, that, it's, um, that we are causing to ourselves. And therefore, just like him, it says, you know, if he just have not played that and he had waited for his injury to heal, he would be continuing playing. But yet he prematurely ended his career. The very fact that he called his, um, that the very fact that he canceled his warning system is the very fact that we can see that pain is a blessing, right? Because guess what? If he had pain, he would not be running up and down the court. And therefore, he would not have broken a bone. Now, I mentioned also about the stages of pain. What are the stages of pain? At first, we have the, the first stage where there we have the pain signal, an alarm that goes off when nerve endings in the, the peripheral sense danger. So we feel like a discomfort, and um, that's the first stage. Second stage of pain, the spinal cord and base of the brain act as a spinal gate to sort out which on one of the many millions of signals deserve to be forwarded as a message to the brain. Which one of them, you know, where is the pain? So the second one is the message. So before knowing where to send the signal, the response it must know where. And this is the second stage of pain. And then we have the third stage of pain, which is the final stage and takes place in the higher brain which sorts through the pre-screen message and decides on a response. So first, you have the feeling of it, right? You feel the danger that something is happening. Second, your body is, um, is preparing a message. And third, th that message is going to be sent. What are you going to do about that pain, right? Now, we also have some things called the pain variants. What are those? Well, one thing is the severity of pain. The second thing is personality makeup. Most, um, some people, they may um, endure more pain than others. And third, our surroundings. Well, let's say if you have a child playing, and I have an example for that after. Um, um, if you have a child playing and they feel pain, at first, you know, they may not realize. But when they come home, when they stop playing, guess what? They're going to be crying and then they will feel the pain. Now, let's put it into real life. So, imagine a girl with friends and she accidentally falls and scrapes her knee. And um, doing that, um, she, she rolls away to avoid any contact with the surface. So she, she immediately she tried to, to do something to not keep um, hurting. Now, if the girl was on a race with friends and this happens, the overall excitement and noise will produce competing messages that will block further progress of pain. Because she's going to be like, oh, I need to keep running, guess what? She's not going to feel the pain as much. The, her surrounding, right? After the race, the excitement goes down and messages of pain will be likely coming. Why is that? Because the message of running, uh, of running in, the, in, the, in the race, it wasn't, you know, um, it was uh, louder than the pain itself. And um, after the race is over, the excitement goes down and messages of pain will likely be coming. The girl looks at her knee and now the conscious brain takes over. Guess what happened? Fear, right? Fear and um, the fear will enhance the pain. Mother will, will become important, so the child comes and turns to her mother. The mother comforts the child and guess what happened? The pain is not as strong anymore. Right? But guess what happened at bedtime? The pain comes back. Why? because that's the only thing that the, the, the brain is receiving, that's the only message. So, we can say that, oh, oh, I went wrong here, sorry. My bad, all right, we are back. The girl's perception of pain varies accordingly to how the pain was blocked at stage two by computing, um, competing input. And at stage three, by the mother's resources to calm the anxiety. She had so many messages coming to her brain at all, once that she didn't even pay attention to the pain when she was running. But yet, when she didn't have as much messages after, guess what? The pain became, you know, more severe. And after when the mother came to calm her, guess what happened? 
she, she felt better. She didn't feel as much pain. Now we also have the pain intensifiers. And what are those? They, they are responses that increase the perception of pain in the conscious mind. So um, just like we have the, the pain variants, we have these pain intensifiers, those things that it happens that, you know, in our minds that it can intensify pain. What are they? Fear, loneliness, guilt, anger, hopelessness. And why those things, they are going to affect us? Well, when we are always fearful about something, let's say, you know, um, you... You search on the internet, you are feeling something, you search in the internet, and you are searched like, okay, um, I'm having a stomachache. And Google always gonna show the worst case scenario. Isn't that right? And then after you read that, guess what happened to your pain? Like when you read one of the symptoms, you know, is having pain in the toe, and then you start having the same pain. Yes. And then you start having, and then when you see, you know, this, these are the things that, that's the fear. The fear is gonna make the pain seems much bigger. And there is this acronym for fear that I like to use, which is false evidence appearing real, right? That's, that's what your fear is. You know, thinking that, you know, what you have is much worse than it actually is. And um, it says here that the problems or the pain only is going to grow or develop when fear grows out of the proportion to the danger. There is two different things between being informed of something and being fearful about the information that you received, right? Now, um, a good example for this is when we, we talk about, um, about this story, where um, in the book, Dr. Paul Brand, he mentions, one of the authors of this book, he, sa he tells the story that he went, um, he was working a lot, and then he went to, um, to the ER once because he was having fevers, chills, and, you know, um, he was just a couple weeks before that, he was turning about, um, let me see the name here, let me get it right, um, cere cerebrospinal meningitis, which at that time, the, 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 they didn't have, they barely had antibiotics, so it was something that, you know, there was like the worst case scenario. And then he started having the very symptoms of it. He started having, you know, fevers, chills, and then when he started thinking about it, he started having pain in his neck, and then he comes to the ER. So when he comes to the ER, the, another doctor sees him and tells, and you know, they're seeing him, and he already gave the doctor and saying, this is, this is what I have. Just, you know, uh, you need to do tests to confirm. But the doctor mentioned to him, just take this, you're gonna be fine. And then he takes that, and um, three days after, he's well again. And the doctor comes back to see him and tells, you know, what was this, that thing that you gave me? And he, he comes to him and said, well, that was um, aspirin for your pain. That's all it was. I was treating you 25% for the pain or for a, a flu that you were having. And 75% I was treating you for fear of meningitis. He wasn't actually, you know, because of his fear, his symptoms and what he was having actually grew so much more than what he actually had it. And the doctor tells him, the doctor saying um, to him, when patients come to you complaining of pain out of all proportion to its physical cause, perhaps you will be more understanding. They feel real pain. As a doctor, you will be treating their fears as well as their organic illnesses or injury. So just like you treat someone's injury, you must be able to also treat, you know, to analyze their fears. Why? Because fears are one of the things that is going to enhance the pain. And therefore, just by not being fearful, or a uh, sensation of pain is going to decrease. So the question is, how, how do we actually manage pain then? You know, um, what, what, what should we be doing? Should we be using herbs? Should we be using medications? Or should we just not do anything at all for it? Well, I want to share a few things that I've, um, that I've learned um, throughout um, the book and as well in my personal studies that you can do to manage pain. First, um, we're going to mention about, you know, it says pain takes place in the mind. That's the final stage. And what calms the mind, guess what will happen? We will enhance my ability to cope with pain. So anything that is going to help calm your mind is going to help for you to manage the pain. 
Why is that? Because, you know, like if you are having, like, let's say, a, a panic attack, if you don't calm yourself down, you're, you're going to be feeling, you know, um, all, all of those things. But yet, you know, when, when you are always fearful, when you are always, you know, thinking that what you have is much worse than it actually is, you are bringing to yourself more and more pain. So, um, now remember that I briefly explained about the three stages of pain, right? And um, the first is the signal, and the second is the message. Now, we cannot do much about the stage one and two, but we can do something about stage three, which is what, um, when it, our response to the pain, what it actually takes place in our minds. And um, doctor, um, the, the same doctor that wrote this book, he tells this, the story that, you know, um, he, had, he had gallstones, and before having a surgery, he was having, like, it was very painful for him. And there were some nights that it was so severe that he just, he couldn't sleep. And because he couldn't sleep, there was one specific night that he came um, and he decided to just go for a walk. He told himself, you know, it was too much pain to be trying to sleep. So he just decided to go for a walk. And walking, he was walking barefoot in this gravel path. And walking barefoot in this, in this gravel path, he started feeling less the pain because kind of it was hurting his feet as well. So he stopped thinking much about the pain in his gallstone, of the gallstones. And then after he realized, he started, you know, just listening to the birds and looking around in nature. And at last, he just noticed he started singing it. And by the time he, he reached back home, guess what happened with the pain? It was gone. And he says, by walking on the shell path, I generated new, more tolerable stage one pain signals which had flooded the spinal gate, affecting stage, um, the second stage. And attentiveness to the world around me influenced stage three, which is what it brings that calmness and serenity into, into ourselves. So um, one of the ways that we can actually manage pain is by distracting it, if, there is, um, if we can say that way. It says, when you are confronted with intense pain, look for activities that will fully absorb you. You know, um, instead of actually saying, oh, I have this pain and, you know, it may be a small pain, uh, a very, you know, you're not having a lot of pain and you just say, okay, I'm just going to stay home and not do anything. And guess what, what, what's going to happen? That's going to be the only message that your brain is going to be receiving. And then the pain is going to be more and more. When you're confronted with intense pain, look for activities that will fully absorb you. Can be mentally, can be activities that is going to fully absorb you physically and look for conscious distractions. Not something that you do unconscious, but that actually you, you know, you need, to, you need to take thought into, you know, read something. Um, and discipline yourself to be active. Why? Because, you know, when we are idle, the pain is gonna, you know, come and become more and more. Um, I, I tell just like in my country in Brazil, when it comes, comes to the age that people, they're, they're going to, um, to retire, and what happened is that, after that, they start having, you know, so much more health problems and so much more pain. Why? Because they, they don't do anything, you know. It doesn't need to be a work, but something to keep them active, you know. Do a garden, do something, you know, read something, right? Now, what are the things that we can use to distract pain? Well, there is three main things that I wanted to use. One of them is reading, you know. What? It's a great thing when you can read scriptures. You can read in the scriptures about people that they, they went through real pain just like you. And what they actually said, they were praising the Lord for the thorns in their flesh. Right? Well, another way is through songs. Through songs, you see people that they actually went through real pain just like you were going through. But yet they wrote one of the most beautiful hymns in, 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 the, in the hymn book. Right? And also you can go for a walk if you are able to. And uh, because just by going to a walk and surrounding yourself in that, in that place, it's going to help for you to distract your mind, take the, your mind um, out of yourself and your pain. It says that my sensations, they are my servants and not my masters. Well, sometimes those things ended up ruling us if they are very, very severe, right? But we can do things that keep us active in order not only to prevent, but also when we are having this pain for us to actually um, not become idle and stay active. And um, one of the ways that you can be active is doing good to others. Um, in the book Ministry of Healing, it says, good deeds are twice a blessing. 
benefiting both the giver and the receiver of the kindness. The consciousness of right doing is one of the best medicines. Consciousness of right doing, doing good to others for, for diseased bodies and minds. When the mind is free and happy for, from a sense of duty well done, well done and the satisfaction of giving happiness to others, the cheering, uplifting influence brings new life to the whole being. Now I want to talk about something that is called the relaxation response as well. So um, the relaxation response, or in other words, uh, the word called meditation, trig triggers our psychological changes in our body. And you, what's going to happen is go we're going to have um, a gradual lowering of our heart rate, but not only that, you know, and the respiratory rates as well, uh, we're, we're going to also decrease, um, a general decrease in sympathetic nervous system activity. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of meditation that, you know, the word is preaching about. You know, the meditation that you empty your mind of everything. That's not the kind of meditation I, I am mentioning. And I'm going to get into it as well. In one, of, in one study, the majority of patients who had failed to find relief for chronic pain in conventional ways, reported at least a 50% reduction in their pain after training in the relaxation response. What they're actually doing with the patients, they were giving them something for them to read that was relaxing. And what was one of the most relaxing things we have to read? The Bible. You can read about stories there of how God helped his people. You know, there is a great book as well called Desire of Ages, where you go through the life of Christ. And it says um, at least a 50% reduction in their pain after training in the relaxation response. In another three-fourths of the patient reported moderate to great improvement. Now, as I said, um, I'm talking about different kind of meditation. Is One of them you can meditate in God's word. But also there is something else called prayer, right? It is a type of meditation as well where you open your, your heart to God. Prayer helps us to cope with pain by moving our focus away from my body's complaints, right? I'm going to repeat that. So prayer is going to help us to cope with the pain because we're going to take our focus from ourselves, from our pain to, to somewhere else. You're not going to take in, it's going to be away from our own complaints. When we, when we are thick, fixed so much in our complaints and our pains, we actually, we end up losing sight of the hope to be set free from those things. So that's why it's important for us to, um, to do these things. Now, there is another study that, uh, that they did, um, which is the effect of in, um, intercessory prayer, praying for one another. There was 393 um, um, cardiac patients, and the group that they were praying for, they had 27 complications, 8 heart failure, um, ne three ne pneumonia, 3 antibiotic use 3, medical ventilation zero, and cardiac arrest three. Now, the group that they weren't praying for, do you think the number is going to be better or worse? They had 44 complications, 20 heart failure, pneumonia 13, antibiotic use 17, medical ventilation from zero to 12, and cardiac arrest three to 14. Do you think prayer can actually affect your, your, your life? It can, not only praying for others, but also keeping your relationship to God. Another thing that is going to help us to manage pain is gratitude. We can complain because rose, rose bushes have thorns or rejo rejoice because thorns have roses. There is two different perspectives. And this is by Alphonse Carr in his book, A Tour Around My Garden. And so we can complain because of the thorns we see in the bushes, or we can see the roses, we can see the beauty in spite of anything that is happening. And I, I like to say that, you know, even in the most difficult times, there is always a reason to be thankful. Isn't it right? Because you can be going through the most difficult time, but there, there are still reasons why you should be thankful for it. And we, we see in the Bible, in 2 Corinthians, um, from uh, chapter 12, 7 to 10, it says, And lest I should be exalted above measure to the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, or what we call in our days, pain, right? The message, message of Satan to buffet me, lest I, I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it departed from me. He was like, I want this pain to go away. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glorify in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest in me. It says, after the therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. How, how, how can you do such a thing? If you think, right? In repro reproach, necessities, persecutions, distress, for Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You know, what I like about this passage is that he, looked, he saw the, 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 the thing that w was for him to be grateful for in the midst of his trouble. He wasn't so focused on himself, on his body complaints, but he was open. He sought the Lord to remove his pain, but yet God didn't remove, but gave him the strength to bear that pain. You see? Now, it says um, in the book, uh, The Gift of Pain says, I rarely feel grateful for the fact of pain, but I almost always feel grateful for the message that it brings. And let's say if you never had such a pain, you know, if you didn't have um, a, um, a pain, a chest pain, you probably are going to have, you know, um, heart problems you're not going to realize until something else happened. And the same thing in, in, for us. We, we need to be thankful also for the message that it brings. Because if that message wasn't brought, we would be seeing so much more sudden deaths than we see today. Because we wouldn't um, take care of it. What about cro chronic pain management? It says that chronic pain management succeeds when the patient accepts the possibility of living a useful life in the presence of pain. And that's an important thing. Why is that? Because, you know, we, we feel pain. And um, I, I've felt, you know, um, severe pain, probably not more than others, you know, just by, you know, falling in a bike and this and that. But it's still, um, that pain, and especially when you see about chronic pain, is about not um, letting the pain, you know, take over you. Do as much as you can as, as the pain permits but also um, succeeds when we think about, you know, that we can live a useful life in the presence of pain. Because if we, if we, we, we are always like, oh, I'm, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do that because of the pain. And we only mention the things that we can't do, and we never stop to think the things that we can actually do, right? Now, the, um, the last quote that I want to share, this quote, uh, it's, you know, it really brought home all that I was studying my lectures because um, I'm going to read it and I'm going to explain. There are ships sailing to many ports, but not a single one goes where life is not painful. Pain, pain is something we cannot avoid because we all go through. Pain is something that, you know, um, that we can numb, but we're not going to be doing the best if we just numb our pains. So what would, be, what would be the ideal reaction to, to pain? Well, it would be a simple thing as you know, you, you have a pain, before you actually um, look for a way to numb the pain, you know, you start asking yourself these questions. Also, um, go to a doctor, seek um, 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 help for that pain, um, tests and other things. But also, you know, um, there, are, there are places where we need to use something to calm down the pain. Because, at, you know, um, you, can't, you can't just say that it's realistic if you have a pain, you know, from 1 to 10 you have a pain 9 that you're going to tell someone to go, um, you know, walk in and this and that. It's not, sometimes it's not realistic. And before you, you do that, you, you, you must take something to help with the pain. And that is why we have, you know, uh, many, many herbs you can take for it. And, um, but also, there is the last quote that I want to share. It says, the health of the body depends largely on its attentiveness to the pain network. Why to attentiveness of the pain network? Well, because um, if we just keep numbing, numbing, numbing that pain, we're not going to receive the message. And just like if we turn off the fire alarm and, and you know, and something is burning, guess what, what's going to happen? The house will burn and then you're going to realize. And the same thing with our health. You don't want to wait until um, you lose your health to gain it back. You want to preserve it, but more than that, you want to listen to it. You want to listen to what pain is actually telling you. Um, so this, this was the lecture for today. Again, if you want to know more about this topic, there is this book called The Gift of Pain, or um, before it was um, titled The Gift Nobody Wants. And uh, it's such a wonderful resource. I was blessed just by reading it. He goes through, um, Dr. Uh, Paul Brandt, he goes through his story when he, you know, he was in three different continents and, you know, he was in India working with um, people with leprosy. 
Then he came to the United States where people were actually, instead of, you know, he was trying to find a way to, you know, to give pain back to the, to the patients because the patients were killing themselves because they didn't have pain. Then he comes to the United States, we are actually finding a way that we can numb our pain more and more. And then he was also practicing in Europe and different places. So it's, it's a wonderful resource to that as well. And um, a few other books that I mentioned um, as well. But this was the one that I most got my resource from. And um, I hope you were blessed by it. And um, I think you also have your slides in the, in the, in the binder as well. So yeah, God bless you.